It was a beautiful early morning on May the 2nd, 2020, that we left for our vacation. We wanted to get to our destination, Orange Beach, Alabama, early enough to find John and Ruth's condominium. It was a long and uneventful drive for 692 miles or a nine-hour journey. Along the way and not Far from Orange Beach, I found Mobile to be an historically interesting city worth visiting in the future. Finally arriving, our first impression of Orange Beach was of a charming coastal city. We eventually found their condominium, Orange Beach Cove Condominium. Their condominium was bright, cheery, and roomy. Light from the bay streamed through the veranda doors, illuminating the living and dining room. After settling in, we enjoyed a cup of coffee on the veranda. We then walked about the back of the condominium to see its several patios, indoor, outdoor pools, and a gymnasium. Directly behind was the marina where we then strolled about. So many boats of all sizes. We knew John had a boat but was away for repair at this time. We rested on these deck chairs and watched the seabirds. Including this floating great blue heron. As day was becoming night, I sat and listened to the strange night sounds of the waterfowl and even including an owl. The next morning, we drove 192 miles north for the next leg of our trip to Selma. Little did we know that we would be on the road that would lead us directly over one of the landmarks we wished to see, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, or sometimes called the site of Bloody Sunday. Twenty-five-year-old activist John Lewis led over 600 marchers across Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma and faced brutal attacks by oncoming state troopers. Footage of the violence collectively shocked the nation and galvanized the fight against racial injustice. Their march to the state capitol in Montgomery was to support the Voting Rights Act, allowing African American citizens their right to vote. But on this pleasant May morning, our walk was peaceful, unlike that of the marchers of 1965. One stop was a historic uh, black church, Mount Gillard Baptist Church. Unlike the difficult walk that the marchers had to follow, we drove in the comfort of our car the 54 miles to Montgomery, stopping at significant places such as campsites and historical places. Colorized photograph of a black and white of one of the campsites, campsite three, and the site as it appears right now on Gardner's farm. We arrived in Montgomery, Alabama, state capital. Finding a place to park, we were very fortunate to be right in front of the state capital, gleaming, gleaming white building. There were two museums we saw in Montgomery, the Legacy Museum from enslavement to mass incarceration, and the second was the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. I did some reading on both these museums after I got home and learned a little bit more. The Legacy Museum is located on the side of a former warehouse where black people were forced to labor in Montgomery and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice 
is the first museum to acknowledge the victims of racial terror and lynchings for more than 4,000 African American men, women, and children who were shot, burned alive, hanged, drowned, and beaten to death uh, by white mobs between 1877 and 1950. Memorial for those lynched or the Legacy Museum. These are some photographs that we found inside. Each was a hologram that gave their story. From here we boarded a bus to the Museum for Peace and Justice. It was a sad place. It was not a place that made you feel happy. And if you were a white person, it made you feel ashamed of your ancestors. The monuments that we saw up on the hill had hanging plaques of each county and each state where those names are enshrined of those lynched. Calhoun County, Georgia, for example. These are the names of the people that were lynched in this county. And it goes through all the counties of each state all of them southern states where lynching occurred. Finally back at Orange Beach, we met with Ruth, who finally had arrived last night. She, she had been head social worker at Presbyterian Hospital in Rockwall before retiring, and John had retired from the food industry. Both were now living comfortably in Orange Beach. After catching up with everyone and everything, we went out for dinner. We made plans for the next day to visit Fort Morgan. This was a military installation built during the War of 1812 and also to see Dolphin Island, hoping to see, of course, dolphins. It was a beautiful morning's drive to Fort Morgan with natural wonders all along the 30-mile drive. Ruth spoke about a paved foot bicycle trail that's called the 43-mile backcountry trail. I later, I later read that it traversed about six ecosystems, had six entry points, along with primitive and well-established campsites.
After convincing Kyoko we drive further east to the village's retirement community in Florida, we embarked on this 426-mile, six-hour drive to see and stay overnight with my first grade teacher, Sister Mary Serafia. She taught first grade at St. Michael's the Archangel School where I attended from 1957 to 1959 in Kansas City, Missouri. This is her after her ordination. The Villages is a retirement community of the likes I've never seen before. Here people drive golf carts instead of cars. She now lives here in this lovely home with Sister Mary Ann Jacinta. All three sisters originally, Serafia, Jacinta, and Sister Patricia, received holy orders together in 1949. This is Sister Serafia at 92 years of age. Now goes by the name of G. Still, she is Sister Serafia to me. She lives with Sister Mary Ann Jacinta, and this is at the same time that she took her vows. Originally, there were three retired nuns who lived at this house. Sister Patricia, who passed away in 2018, all received their holy orders together. Sister Patricia was a hospital administrator, Jacinta a school principal, and Serafia taught first grade. She also had a master's degree in music and voice. I had the good fortune to have met all three nuns some years ago. When they visited the Vatican, they met and received Holy Communion from Pope John Paul. I did make a recording of both, first as Sister Serafia, then Mary Ann. Who is this? Is the father? Which one is the father? Yeah, that's my dad. This one, the tall one. Okay. And those are my two brothers. This one died in the oh, big war. Brothers. My brother died in the war, big oh, war. Okay. <laughs> he died in the Pacific. And so, this this younger sister is still living. Yeah, that's this is Kathleen, the one that's living. Uh huh. Okay. In the end. And then this is Elizabeth Ann, she's dead, um, the small one. She said, why don't you uh, go out and uh, they have this machine where you can take the corn and get it off of the cob, you know? Yes. And so I said, oh yeah, I'll do that. So I went out and I said, well, we better clean this barrel out first. Right. So I'm cleaning it out. And there was a dead mouse in there. And I'm deathly afraid of a mouse. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I screamed. I went in. They thought I broke my arm or something. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We finished breakfast and sat here, and I interviewed them. The memories are many, and I do have a peculiar talent for recall, but I won't go into all that at this particular time. After the visit... Kyoko was glad that we went. The next morning, we had an uneventful drive from the villages back to Orange Beach, Alabama, to John and Ruth's condominium. It was an hour and a half drive from Orange Beach to the site of the USS Alabama. The Alabama was the fourth and final member of the South Dakota class of fast battleships built for the U.S. Navy in the 1930s. I had read she had had many deployments during her career. Took one eye standing on the foredeck. In the sun, it was a hot day. Ruth and Kyoko, and I could not resist a hug from Ruth either.
the officers and men's quarters and the kitchen galley, etc., were all restored to what they would have looked like in the time of World War II. She was transferred for Pacific operations against the Japanese. The first of these were the Gilbert and Marshall Island campaigns. She also participated in the Mariana and Palau Island campaign, the uh, Battle of the Philippine Sea. She became the flagship for Rear Admiral Edward Hansen during their invasion of Guam. Uh, it's, she supported the Battle of Leyte Gulf, supporting the fighting forces in the Battle of Okinawa, and her last campaigns contributed sailors and marines to the initial occupation force in search of prisoner of war camps. The city itself was really a floating city. Sitting in her cradle besides Mobile Bay is the World War II submarine, USS Drum. It was uh, named after a type of fish. The Drum is the oldest American submarine on public display. She had a 72-member crew in her missions during the war. The submarine was brought to Mobile to join the USS Alabama at Battleship Memorial Park as a war memorial and museum in 1969. The history of the USS Drum is rather lengthy and I find very interesting, and you can find many resources at its website. Our next destination would be Dolphin Island. It was a warm day and we had to wait almost an hour before we could drive aboard the ferry. So we found a comfortable place to sit in the shade and wait. Finally boarding, we got out and enjoyed the cool gulf breeze for the 40 minute cruise to the island. Upon arrival, we were greeted by pelicans resting on a long, rocky outcropping. Much to my amusement, we didn't really see any dolphins here, but later found out the name of the island is not dolphin, but Dolphin, the French title for the eldest son of the King of France. Finally on the island, we were all hungry and found a seafood restaurant I had a grilled cheese sandwich with sweet potato fries and a salad. They had seafood. Opting not to take the ferry back, we took the Alabama Coastal Highway. And you'll get a thrill out of this nice hill that we're going over, anticipating what we're going to see. Satisfied that we didn't see the next business for a boat excursion the out to the bay to look for dolphins. You know? Yeah, we're going to go to the bay to look for dolphins.
The dolphin boat ride was not as spectacular as I had imagined. However, we did catch some dolphins from a distance and a few that were able to bob up from the water. You'll see here um, some motion as well as some stop motion and close-ups of the uh, what I could see of the dolphin, which is oh, yeah, the dorsal yeah. fin. Out here looking at them, and they're wondering why are these folks out here looking at us. Yeah, they hear us too, don't they? Ah, there's two. Oh, this is probably the best shot that we had on the whole trip on our way back. And you see the dorsal fins of both dolphins. It looks like there's probably three also. There. Yeah. I did see his tail. Yes, there he is. Kyoko and I finished up our boat ride and then we headed back. Uh, to visit with John, who didn't really come with us on, on a lot of the trips, as he probably hadn't been there with, before with his grandkids. Our next destination would be to New Orleans. First destination in New Orleans was to visit Tulane University, which was nearby. Tulane was where my grandfather attended the pharmacy school, graduating in 1917. I was looking for the school yearbook, but it was not available in the main, but in the special collections library. We had the whole place to ourselves and assistance from the librarian. Photographs have been enhanced and colorized. Returning to the Columns Hotel, we rested a bit, preparing for our trip to the French Quarter the next day.
Dave's Lays Challenge and try to get some dinner money. Thanks for helping out a local. Well, our tour this morning had finished, and we were pretty much free to wander the streets alone by ourselves, photographing whatever we thought was interesting. And no, Jim Morrison was did not stay here. This was great. I happened to photograph these ladies. I wish I had videoed when they popped the cork at the same time. This fence was really unusual in that you see the corn painted on the fence. There's a story behind this residence, although I cannot recall. This is one of the older homes in New Orleans dating from the early 1700s. Leaving the cathedral, we stepped back into the secular world of New Orleans, taking in the historic sites. We stopped to read this plaque, which summarizes the purchase of Louisiana. And this is the Cabadillo, or City Hall, built in 1795. It is where the Louisiana Territory was purchased, more than doubling the size of the United States. We walked around Jackson Square we, and stopped to see the commemorative fountain erected when President of France, Charles de Gaulle, was here with his wife in 1960.
Andrew Jackson rides upon his horse in the center of the historic square was dedicated in 1856. Finishing up, we worked our way back to the Café du Monde for chicory coffee, shea, and some jam. We had a late breakfast, so we were sure hungry when we found our way to the French Market Pavilion with many food courts. Our last day at the Columns Hotel, I walked around taking photographs of the outside courtyards and also indoors at the different rooms, living room, dining room, probably what had been once the dining room at the time when it was a residence. Lafayette Cemetery is a historic cemetery in the Guard District, not far from where we were staying at the Columns Hotel. The cemetery is, was currently closed and it's not clear when it will reopen, but I was able to at least get a peek through the main gate. The cemetery is still in use today. Not being satisfied that we didn't see any cemetery, we drove through this unnamed cemetery on our way out of the city. Unlike the older cemeteries, this one had broader avenues, was a little bit more cleaned up, but still the graves, if you see, are all above ground because the city is below sea level. Any burials below the ground as they are done here, the graves will tend to flood and the coffins will tend to surface.
And with that, we were on our way home. Our drive from New Orleans back to Rockwall was 480 miles hours, and the total trip was 2,671 before we finally made it back to home sweet home. 